It is good to see you again tonight. If you have any prayer request updates, I hope you'll let me know right away. You can use the contact information on the screen there by email or by text or call to that number. If you're joining us on the phone tonight, the church number is 608-224-0274. We'd love to hear from you if you have any updates, anything that we need to be praying about. And just to review our schedule this week, remember that we are we are continuing to have two worship services this coming Lord's Day to keep us under the 25% capacity in our building to give us some space to spread out safely. So be sure to uh, sign up for one of those two services. If you need any help with that, please contact either me or Kenna and we'd be glad to help out. Our plan is to continue this class every Wednesday uh, exclusively online and then at the building and online every Sunday, just as we have been doing for worship, maybe making some adjustments as we go forward as needed. So please let me know if you have any questions or concerns, and please be sure to sign up online. That makes sure that we have enough communion supplies and also make sure that we don't all show up at one service. So this past Sunday, we were very evenly split between the two services, had a good group at both, and that fellowship in between is just amazing. And it uh, has been so good to stand out on the front lawn and to uh, be with all of you in that way. Uh, usually we try to start our Wednesday class by sharing what we are thankful for. We share our good news for the week. What, what have we appreciated over the last few days? But we really haven't had a chance to do this properly lately. This format is not conducive to sharing. And so, I mean, if you can, please feel free to share in the comments anything that you're thankful for. But I know not everybody can see the comments. Either you're not signed in on YouTube. I don't think they don't allow... Uh, comments to be made unless you're signed in on your account, or you might be watching this in full screen as some of you do, maybe uh, cast to a, a larger screen in your living room or something, and so the uh, comments are not visible. So I hope it's okay for, for me at least to continue to share some good news, some things that I'm thankful for in my life. Uh, I should be directing our youth camp right now. So this is strange for me. I should be in Wisconsin's Northwood, surrounded by mosquitoes and and a hundred children and Christian friends uh, in, in the forest. But uh, in the, the absence of camp this week, I'm thankful that I was able to make a quick trip up north on Sunday afternoon and uh, got, to, got to make it to the Beaver Creek Reserve earlier this week. I headed up north Sunday uh, after worship and camped at the Black River State Forest in the Castle Mound Campground. Got to do some hiking on Sunday evening as well as uh, well before sunrise on Monday, just uh, just barely light outside, about an hour before the sun came up, and it was awesome. Uh, I'll tell you, the mosquitoes and the biting flies were thick. They were thick, and I mean, it was hard to see in some situations. And in fact, the cloud of biting flies followed me in the car as I left the campground, and they were with me until I got up to about 15 miles an hour. So <laughs> that particular species of fly can fly 15 miles an hour. And um, anyway, I finally escaped the mosquitoes and the flies and uh, headed out uh, early on Monday morning, hit some thrift stores in the Eau Claire area on Monday morning, uh, waiting for some of those storms to pass. If you haven't figured it out all, uh, by now, the, the pictures on the screen there are from Castle Mound. Uh, area there at uh, Black River Falls. Just some beautiful, beautiful hiking that I experienced there. Once I got to Eau Claire, once the storms passed, uh, made my way over to the Eau Claire River uh, near the campground that we rent every year. I got a kayak a few weeks ago, so I put it in where we usually put our canoes in for camp every day at camp. But uh, instead of going downstream, I went upstream and the river was high. It had very strong current, but I uh, paddled upstream for about an hour and a half, and I think I made it about 10 feet. Um, it, it was some hard paddling, but I did make it quite a way, and I'm, I'm thankful that I uh, made it quite a way uh, upstream, and then I floated back down to where I put in, which took a lot less time, obviously. I missed having the campers up there with me, but at the same time, it was nice to be on the river alone and to not see a single human being for several hours. It was very good. And then I stopped by the youth camp and posted a video for the kids and took some pictures that I've been sharing each day this week uh, on the Beaver Creek Bible Camp Facebook page. If you have not yet liked that page, I would invite you to do that. And kind of off subject here a little bit, speaking of Facebook, I noticed earlier today that the Four Lakes Church of Christ Facebook page has 499 likes at this moment. So if you would like to be the one 
who puts it over to 500. If you have not yet liked our uh, Four Lakes Church page, uh, I would invite you. This would be a good time to go ahead and do that. But I'm thankful in my life for safe travels and for a safe camping experience in Wisconsin's Northwoods earlier this week. Uh, tonight we get back to our study of the book of Luke in our class. I've been referring to this book over and over again, A Harmony of the Gospels by Robert Thomas and Stanley Gundry, usually available on Amazon for about 25 bucks. If you don't have it yet, um, it'll probably be to your house in a few days. If you need any help with that, let me know. Uh, by way of review, Luke was a medical doctor. He was a Gentile. He writes these two books to a man by the name of Theophilus, and he focuses on chronological order. He includes a lot of groups that are often neglected or overlooked, especially in the ancient world, widows, Gentiles, Samaritans, the sick, the poor, and on and on. Last week, we looked at Luke 8. We started with the list of women who supported Jesus financially out of their own private means. We looked at the parable of the soils. We had Jesus calming a storm on the Sea of Galilee. We had the healing of the demon-possessed man. And then we ended with the healing of the woman who had been bleeding for 12 years, as well as the raising of Jairus' daughter. Before we move into Luke chapter 9, I want us to clear up a very good question from Luke chapter 8. Uh, last week, one of our members called or texted, I can't remember which one, but her question was, what in the world happened to Luke 8, 19 through 21 in the Harmony of the Gospels? And so she had been following along in this book. And when we got out of Luke 8, verse 18, uh, 19 through 21 was not there. And I had forgotten about something rather unusual that had happened in the Harmony of the Gospels in that circumstance. I'd seen it earlier in my study, uh, but I failed to mention it in class. So basically, if you were following along in the Harmony last week, you might have noticed that it seemed to skip over verses 19 through 21. But the reason is, verses 19 and 21 are out of, chrono out of chronological order, and so they are included earlier. And this is unusual in Luke. We don't see this very often in Luke, because Luke usually does a very good job of keeping things in order, unlike some of the other uh, gospel accounts. And so as a reminder, if you are using the harmony, and if you ever lose any verses, if something disappears, you don't know where a passage is, because it's out of order, um, you can always go to the very back of the book, and there is a scripture index there where every passage is laid out in what we would call canonical order, in the order in scripture, and then they give a section number and a page number where that passage can be found. And so as you can see on the screen, you'll notice that Luke 8, um, you know, this passage that we're talking about, 19 through 21, are actually found on page 79 which is out of order in the harmony, but this index near the back will help you find that. So I hope that makes sense, uh, but I'm thankful for the very good question, and I hope that this helps as we use the harmony as a tool. So we pick up tonight with Luke 9. It's a rather long chapter, so we'll only be looking at the first 45 verses tonight. Uh, in the harmony, we're missing the healing of the two blind men in Matthew 9. That's not included here in Luke. We're also missing the healing of a demon-possessed man who couldn't speak, we miss Jesus' last trip to Nazareth in Matthew 13 and Mark 6, where the locals just couldn't get over the fact that Jesus is the carpenter's son. That's the way they looked at him, and so they just wouldn't listen to his message. And that then brings us to Luke chapter 9. So let's look at Luke 9, verses 1 through 11, as we begin our study tonight. Luke 9, verses 1 through 11. And he called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over all the demons and to heal diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to perform healing. And he said to them, Take nothing for your journey, neither a staff, nor a bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not even have two tunics apiece. Whatever house you enter, stay there until you leave that city. And as for those who do not receive you, as you go out from that city, shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. Departing, they began going through the villages, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Now Herod the Tetrarch heard of all that was happening, and he was greatly perplexed because it was said by some that John had risen from the dead, and by some that Elijah had appeared, and others that one of the prophets of old had risen again. Herod said, I myself had John beheaded, but who is this man about whom I hear such things? And he kept trying to see him. 
When the apostles returned, they gave an account to him of all that they had done. Taking them with him, he withdrew by himself to a city called Bethsaida. But the crowds were aware of this and followed him. And welcoming them, he began speaking to them about the kingdom of God and curing those who had need of healing. If I remember correctly, this is sometimes referred to as the limited commission. We know the great commission is the one at the end of the gospel accounts. Jesus, right before his ascension, sending his apostles out into all the world to preach the gospel. But this is more limited of a commission. And in Matthew's account, he sends them uh, not to all of creation, but he sends them on this journey to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And so they are being sent only to the Jews. So this is a limited commission. And we find in this passage that they are to preach the kingdom of God. Uh, Matthew tells us that they are to preach that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, or the kingdom of heaven is near. That is uh, Matthew 10, verse 7. The kingdom, as we've discussed before, refers to God's rule. And we know now that God rules in his church. Remember, the church had not yet been established when Jesus sent these men out. Uh, the church would be established a bit later in Acts chapter 2. And so the kingdom was at hand. It was very near at this point. But, uh, but now, of course, now today in 2020, it is already here. Uh, I would also emphasize that as they preach, they are not um, to tell people just to take their word for it. Uh, but their preaching is to be accompanied by miraculous signs. And uh, Luke refers to healing in verse 2. Matthew and Mark refer to Jesus giving them authority over every kind of disease, every kind of sickness, and authority over the unclean spirits. And so as they preach the kingdom of heaven, uh, they are to demonstrate that they are speaking with God's authority by uh, performing these miraculous deeds. Several days ago, I had uh, a bit of an ongoing discussion with a Mormon elder. And whenever I would quote scripture, uh, he would say that he respected my opinion. And it was so frustrating because I would quote the word of God. And he would say, say yeah, I, I respect your opinion. And I kept thinking, that's, <laughs> that's not my opinion. <laughs> I just quoted the word of God. You know, I wasn't sharing my opinion. I was literally reading the word of God. Uh, on his part, though, as he tried to get me to accept the Book of Mormon as another testament of Jesus Christ, the only proof that he had that it came from God was that I just needed to pray to God. And I needed to ask God to confirm it in my heart. Isn't that interesting? You know, we can quote the word of God, uh, but on their part, they're telling us we just need to pray harder. We need to ask God in our heart uh, whether that particular denominational book is true. But I just find it interesting. We don't have that anywhere in the Bible. You know, nowhere do the apostles tell people, uh, just believe me. You know, just pray harder and then you'll know that what I'm saying is true. You know, ask for confirmation from God in your heart. No, they don't say anything like that. Uh, but instead, they prove their words to be true with these miraculous deeds that they were able to perform. So Jesus sent them out to preach, and that preaching was accompanied by miraculous signs. And now, of course, we have the written record of these miraculous deeds confirming that the word of God is legitimate. And so these 12 are sent out. Matthew names them here. We don't have the renaming of them here. We just had that uh, recently in Luke elsewhere. In verses 3 and 4, Jesus tells them how they'll be supported financially as they travel. In Luke, he tells them to take nothing for their journey, neither staff, nor bag, nor bread, nor money. You know, don't even have two tunics. Don't even have two garments. Don't even take a change of clothes. Just leave now. You know, wherever you are, we're leaving from here. We're going to go out and preach. Get out there quickly. Go preach. You know, don't stop at REI and get yourself outfitted for a huge you know, backpacking journey. Don't collect all of this stuff, uh, but instead just take what you have on you right now and go. And uh, according to the other accounts, uh, basically the message here is depend on those to whom you are preaching to supply your needs. And so in a sense, uh, this journey would be a test of faith for these 12 men. You know, whatever you're wearing right now, just go get out the door and go start preaching the kingdom. At this point, we have a, a somewhat troubling difference between the three accounts. Matthew and Luke here 
uh, have Jesus telling them not to take a staff, but Mark says they should take nothing except a mere staff. And I looked into this a little bit, you know, as a possible contradiction between the accounts. And Apologetics Press has a great article on this. There, there were some other resources online, but Apologetics Press had the best information on this in a search online for info on this possible contradiction. I'll try to put a link in the description if I can remember to do that or send it out in some other way. But it, it's basically the difference between taking a staff and acquiring a staff. And so the difference between these accounts is a difference in the way that these men, the writers of these accounts, use a certain Greek words. And so the idea is, if you have one already, feel free to take it along. But if you don't have a staff, don't bother getting one. And I think that's the general idea here. Just get out there and start preaching immediately. Don't let your lack of a walking stick hold you back from making this journey. In verse 5, we have some instruction on what to do if they are rejected. If people from a certain place won't listen, then just leave. You know, move on. Uh, earlier, Jesus had referred to casting your pearls before swine. Don't do that. Basically, if people refuse to listen, if they don't appreciate the message, if they're being stubborn about it, just don't bother with that. Don't keep harassing people with the gospel. You know, there are millions more who need the message. And so if they're not accepting it, you know, just keep on moving. And then over in Matthew's account, Jesus continues uh, saying that he's sending them out as sheep in the midst of wolves. He makes a prediction that the time will come when they'll be brought up on charges uh, before governors and kings for preaching the gospel. But they're not to be anxious. They're not to be afraid, but they're just to keep on speaking. Uh, Matthew includes Jesus' warning about opposition coming from within their own families. And he warns them, he gives them a heads up, your own people will reject you and they'll harass you over this. And I think we've seen this right here in Madison, where people obey the gospel and they are practically disowned by their own families. Years ago, some of you remember this very touching moment. Uh, a young woman was baptized and as she came up out of the water, dripping wet, standing beside the baptistry, uh, she gave a number. And I don't remember what it was, you know, 189 days or, or whatever the number. But that was the number of days until she turned 18 because her parents were giving her such a difficult time for obeying the gospel. She was looking forward to being able to get away from some of that. But Jesus predicted that opposition. He continues in Matthew by telling them to take up their cross and follow him, which we'll get to later here. In verse 6, we uh, have these warnings. Uh, they divide up. They go out to preach. As this happens, word gets back to Herod. And the rumor going around is John the Baptist has come back from the dead. And that's, that's a little bit concerning to King Herod, considering how John died. And so there's a little bit of a flashback. John is dead, and King Herod is the man who had him beheaded. And so in Matthew and Mark, we have more background info as to how John dies. Uh, John, of course, had been preaching that it was not lawful for Herod to have his brother's wife. That never goes over very well. Um, especially with Herod's wife. And so uh, when they had a party and Herod's wife's daughter danced seductively at this party, King Herod promises her anything up to half of his kingdom. And she asks for John the Baptist's head on a platter, which she receives. And uh, that's kind of the background here. And I, I think we see why King Herod is worried. There's this famous preacher out there and he's in the wilderness and he's doing things and it's sounding like John. And so he's worried that maybe John has come back from the dead. He's got a little baggage there. Uh, nevertheless, when the apostles come back from their preaching tour, uh, they give a report to Jesus. Jesus uh, takes them to a small fishing village so they can try to get some quiet time away from the crowds. Over in Mark's account is where Jesus says, Come away by yourselves to a lonely place and rest a while, for there were many people coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. Uh, some of you might know that in my work agreement with the church here, I don't think of it as a contract. It's more of a like an understanding between us that, uh, you know, we just put down on paper when we moved here um, just over 20 years ago. There's this like one page summary of what I promised to do and what you promised to do. So it's all out there. and Everybody knows it. But I'm mentioning this because we have this verse uh, introducing the section about taking time off. 
uh, the, the Marx version of this account. You know, the Lord's work is important. It's very important to be busy and to do the right things and to be out there teaching and preaching. But at the same time, it's also important to take some time to get away and uh, go off by a lonely uh, place by yourself. So obviously, uh, this doesn't work for too long with Jesus and the apostles. The crowds find out where they are, and uh, Jesus continues right on uh, teaching and healing. At this point, though, the harmony points out that there is something of a shift in Jesus' ministry, and I think we'll see this throughout Luke chapter 9, from public to more private. Before this, Jesus is always out there, you know, going to the people from one place to another, but now he seems to start focusing more on privately teaching the apostles, not them exclusively. He'll still teach crowds, but this is a shift in this trend, and uh, they, they give a few possible reasons for this in the commentary. The jealousy of King Herod made teaching more dangerous. Uh, the misguided zeal of some who were trying to make him king by force. Jesus didn't want to be a physical king. The hostility of the Jewish leaders was intensifying. The disciples' need for rest due to the grueling hours, and then also the need to teach the apostles more privately so he could prepare these men for his coming departure so that they would be ready to go uh, when the Lord leaves this earth. All right, let's continue looking then at uh, Luke chapter 9, verses 12 through 17. Luke 9, 12 through 17. Now the day was ending, and the twelve came and said to him, Send the crowd away, that they may go into the surrounding villages and countryside and find lodging and get something to eat. For here we are in a desolate place. But he said to them, you give them something to eat. And they said, We have no more than five loaves and two fish, unless perhaps we go and buy food for all these people. For there were about 5,000 men. And he said to his disciples, Have them sit down to eat in groups of about 50 each. They did so and had them all sit down. Then he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed them and broke them and kept giving them to the disciples to set before the people. And they all ate and were satisfied, and the broken pieces which they had left over were picked up, twelve baskets full. This account is found in all four gospel accounts, which is rare. In fact, I believe this is the only miracle that is found in all four gospel accounts, except for perhaps the resurrection. If I'm wrong on that, let me know. But I believe this is the only miracle in all four, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So in the harmony, we have four columns here. Uh, basically, they are surrounded by thousands of people. They are in the middle of nowhere. It's getting late. And the apostles start getting worried about feeding all of these people. There's this sense of responsibility. They've come to hear Jesus. We're Jesus' people. And now we have these thousands of people gathered here, and they're going to start getting hungry. Uh, in John, uh, Jesus sees the people and says to Philip, where are we to buy bread that these may eat? So in John, Jesus seems to be giving Philip something of a growth opportunity. In Luke, he addresses the disciples as a group. You give them something to eat. And it seems the apostles first have this problem with the gathering people and not enough food, so they take it to the Lord. But either way, we find in verse 14 that there are around 5,000 men. Matthew specifically tells us this figure does not include women and children. So I'm guessing that there might have been somewhere around 10,000 people here, maybe 15, 20,000 or more. We don't really know. We know there were 5,000 men. Do we have any idea what it takes to feed 10,000 plus people? Some of you know my wife used to work in the main kitchen at the school district, and they would feed somewhere around 22,000 people every day. And they had a, it was a huge, highly efficient food production facility. I mean, they had a freezer in that building, which probably was the size of our church building. You know, huge vats and ovens and stovetops and you know, two food production lines with, you know, maybe a couple dozen employees working on those lines. I mean, it was a huge operation. So we can hardly imagine, most of us anyway, feeding 10,000, 20,000 people, you know, not right outside a commercial kitchen, but in the middle of nowhere. This, this is an impossibility. Uh, this, by the way, figured into us canceling our youth camp this summer. 
Uh, back in April, as we were making this decision, we were having shortages of food in certain places. Some of you remember this. If you remember, places like Sam's Club uh, didn't have any meat on the shelves. Remember that? That was right when we're making the decision about whether to have Bible camp this summer. And so we're wondering, a couple months out, whether we'll be able to feed 100 people three times a day for a week in the middle of the North Woods. And we're not sure whether it would even be possible or practical, or advisable, or, you know, possible to do it safely. But here we have somewhere around 10,000 people in the middle of no, uh, nowhere. You know, no Sam's Club, no Costco nearby, nothing like that. In Mark and John, Philip makes the point that 200 denarii worth of bread wouldn't be enough to feed this many people. Remember, a denarius was one day's wage, and so 200 days wages, you know, we can figure that out. Whether it's an average professional type salary here in Madison, whether it's a minimum wage type thing. I mean, we're talking, I mean, that's a broad spectrum, isn't it? You know, anywhere from $20,000 to $50,000 plus. That's a lot of people. And if you've ever paid for a meal at a wedding, you might understand just a little bit about that. You know, how much it costs to feed hundreds upon hundreds of people. It is expensive to feed 10,000 plus people. Not only is it expensive, uh, it's pretty much impossible late in the day like this to feed this many people in the wilderness. But notice what they have available. <laughs> Five loaves of barley bread and two fish. Uh, John tells us that this is from a lad, a little boy. And so uh, there is this kid with a sack lunch. He's the only one smart enough to bring some food with him. Probably his mom made him take this, you know, here, you're going to need this. And he did. And, uh, okay, that's just an assumption, you know, with my experience with mothers. Um, but nevertheless, you know, that's, that's it. That's all they have in this, in this huge group. So Jesus then tells the apostles when he learns this, you know, have everybody sit down for dinner <laughs> in groups of hundreds and fifties. He takes the five loaves and the two fish. He blesses the bread described by John as giving thanks for it. That's a little bit clarifying, which is interesting. To bless the bread is to give thanks for the bread. And he starts distributing the bread and the fish through the disciples and just keeps it on handing it out until everybody is full and even beyond. At the end, we also notice they collect the leftovers. They had so much food. Notice, though, they do not waste the food, even though it was free. It'd be very easy to say, oh, well, you know, we didn't pay for this. We're just going to leave it here. But they don't. That's interesting to me. Uh, they conserve. They are wise with the resources and they collect the leftovers. Uh, sometimes I will refer to the writings of William Barclay, a Scottish scholar from the mid-20th century. He was something of an expert on the Greek language and has a great series of commentaries, uh, has some good comments many times. However, he did not believe in miracles. And if you remember how he explains this one, he said that uh, once the little boy gave up his lunch, everybody else gave up their lunch as well. Oh, look at what he did. Okay, I'm going to whip out my lunch too. And uh, he was motivational. And therefore, because of the little boy's example, everybody shared. And that's what really happened here. Uh, that, however, uh, definitely, absolutely, in no way explains 12 baskets full of leftovers. I mean, it's amazing to me what some people will do to try to uh, evade anything supernatural in the Bible. But that was his attempt, that everybody saw what he did, and they felt guilty or motivated or whatever, and they shared all the food that they had stuffed away somewhere in the wilderness. Uh, in Matthew, Mark, and John, we have some of the crowds try to make Jesus king by force again uh, at this point. And once again, he escapes. He does not let that happen. Remember, there is a doctrine known as premillennialism, where Jesus comes to establish his kingdom, he fails, so he establishes the church instead, kind of a you know, backup plan, and, and there's still some time in the future when Jesus is supposed to return to this earth for a do-over so he can really establish his kingdom like he always wanted to. All right, that's the theory of premillennialism. That is not what happened. I'm saying that's what that doctrine is in a nutshell. I think somebody said uh, pre means before, millennial means a thousand, and ism means it ain't so. And I think that'd be a good definition of that theory. So that's not what happened. If Jesus had wanted to be an earthly king, he could have been an earthly king right here. And I say that because of the other accounts. They tried to come and take him and make him their king. 
Uh, as it is, though, the church is the kingdom, and uh, we have no record of Jesus promising to ever set foot on this earth again. At his second coming, he will not come to this earth. He will meet us in the air, if you remember, and then uh, we will meet him in the air. He will take us with him. In Matthew, Mark, and John, we also have Jesus walking on the water here. We studied this in sermon form a couple months ago, but the account is not found in Luke. Um, they then seem to go back and forth across the Sea of Galilee a few times for various healings. There's a lot of teaching. There's a lot that is found in the other accounts that is not found here in Luke. So right at this moment, Luke skips over quite a bit. Uh, most of what happens in John 6 gets inserted here. The extended discussion on Jesus being the bread of life gets put in here. Uh, then we have quite a bit more traveling, more teaching, the run-in with the Pharisees being upset at Jesus' disciples eating with unwashed hands. Uh, we have the feeding of the 4,000, uh, this time starting with seven loaves of bread and a few small fish. So these are two different accounts. Uh, we have some more teaching and healing. And now we pick up with Luke chapter 9, verse 18. So Luke 9, 18 through 22. And it happened that while he was praying alone, the disciples were with him, and he questioned them, saying, Who do the people say that I am? They answered and said, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, but others that one of the prophets of old has risen again. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said, The Christ of God. But he warned them and instructed them not to tell this to anyone, saying, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and raised up on the third day. So they've been together for a while now, and Jesus uh, seems to give the apostles a, a pop quiz. It's almost like an opinion poll, and he, he's taking this poll, he's assessing what they know and what people think, and after this period of prayer, he questions them. He wants to know, who do people say that I am? You know, what's going on? You know, what are people saying? The leading theories are either John the Baptist or Elijah, or maybe another one of the prophets who's come back from the dead. <laughs> That's not a bad comparison, you know. That's good company to be in. But he wants to know, but who do you say that I am? You know, do you believe this, or is there something else going on in your minds? And, of course, it's Peter who speaks up. He says, the Christ of God. In Matthew, he says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So Matthew has a more complete record of what happens here and what Peter actually says. This is what we know as the good confession. Uh, this seems to be one of those steps in God's plan of salvation. I mean, at some point between hearing about Jesus and being baptized, we need to come to the understanding of who he is, that he is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. We have to admit that publicly. It's not a secret thing. It's something that we, we speak openly. And Peter is at this point now, and he knows that Jesus is the Messiah. Messiah is the Hebrew form. Christ is the Greek form. Both words refer to someone who has been anointed, as in anointed to be a king. So this is a, a huge, a huge admission on Peter's part. In Matthew, we have more of an extended discussion on the distinction between Peter being a stone and Jesus promising to build his church on the bedrock of Peter's confession. So unlike what many have suggested, the church is not built on Peter. That is a misunderstanding of this account over in Matthew. But the church is built on Peter's confession. Not built on Peter, but built on what Peter said, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Uh, at the end, we notice how Jesus warns them not to tell anybody about this. The crowds aren't ready for it, and this is where Jesus straight up predicts his own death and resurrection. And certainly to those who heard this for the first time, even this was probably a little bit foggy, a little bit unclear. But looking back on it, obviously, what Jesus predicts in verse 22 is exactly what happens with his death and resurrection a little bit less than a year after this. In Matthew and Mark, Peter objects and says, God forbid, Lord, this shall never happen to you. And this is where Jesus says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. For you are not setting your mind on God's interest, but man's. I find it interesting that Peter goes from being the only one who gets it, the only one who understands that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, to being called Satan. <laughs> I mean, within just a few verses, there's praise for Peter and then get behind me, Satan. That's quite the, quite the fall over just like a few minutes. 
So I think like all of us, Peter is a work in progress. So that leads us to what comes next in Luke. Let's look at Luke chapter 9, verses 23 through 27. Luke 9, 23 through 27. And he was saying to them all, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. But I say to you truthfully, there are some of those standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Going into this passage, we need to understand that the cross was a cruel and gruesome form of capital punishment. We don't have anything even remotely like this today in our country. Uh, the Romans pretty much borrowed it from the Persians, and then they perfected it to make it absolutely as cruel and as publicly humiliating as possible. To crucify somebody was not just punishment, it was a public statement. Do not do what this guy did, or this might happen to you. And so they made it as public and as painful as possible. They would nail people to a cross, to a piece of wood, and would let them hang there sometimes for days. Uh, the word excruciating, by the way, uh, comes from Latin and literally means out of the cross, excruciating. And so today, if we refer to, oh, I'm in excruciating pain, that's the history, that's the etymology of that word, that, that reference ultimately goes back to the Roman practice of crucifixion. And so here, when Jesus talks about being killed, and when Peter objects, Jesus responds with, this statement. Not only will Jesus be killed, but each of his followers must also be willing to take up his cross to follow him. And of course, carrying one's own cross to the place of crucifixion, that was part of the process. That was part of the public punishment. That was part of the humiliation. As they did for Jesus, crowds would often form. They would gather around and they would verbally torment those who were carrying their crosses on their way to being crucified. And so this is how the Christian life is pictured. It is a life of constant self-denial and sacrifice. We also notice here that it is a daily thing that we do. It's something we choose to do on a daily basis. In other words, you know, this is the way that we live. It's not a one-time act. It's not a one-time sacrifice. But the Christian life is pictured as carrying a cross on a daily basis. The Lord then throws in something of a paradox. Whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for his sake will save it. In other words, we don't go through this life trying to live. We're not here to live it up. But we go through this life trying to please God. That's what life is all about, serving him. In verse 25, we have the question, what do we profit if we gain the whole world and lose or give up or forfeit ourselves or our soul? And of course, the answer is nothing. If we lose our soul, we have truly lost everything regardless of what we might have gained in terms of physical possessions. In verse 26, he continues with something of, I would look at it like a deal or an agreement would be a better way of saying it. If we are ashamed of him in this life, he'll be ashamed of us in the next. We don't want to be in that situation. He closes with the statement that there are some people hearing him speak these words who would not see death until they see the kingdom of God. So either some of these people are still with us today, having lived more than 2,000 years, or Jesus is predicting that the kingdom would be established in the fairly near future, within a few years of him making this statement. And based on what we know elsewhere in Scripture, I would go with option B. He, he was not predicting miraculously long lifespans here, but he was predicting that the kingdom would be coming in the near future, in the lifetime of many of those who are listening. And certainly this fits in with what John the Baptist was preaching, that the kingdom of heaven was at hand, it was near. And of course, the references to the kingdom before Acts 2 refer to it coming at some point in the future. And almost all of the references to the kingdom after Acts 2 point back, and they refer to the kingdom having already been established. So everything seems to point to the kingdom 
being established in Acts chapter 2. All right, let's move on to Acts 9, 28 through 36. Acts 9, 28 through 36. Some eight days after these sayings, he took along Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face became different, and his clothing became white and gleaming. And behold, two men were talking with him, and they were Moses and Elijah, who, appearing in glory, were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions had been overcome with sleep, but when they were fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. And as these were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah, not realizing what he was saying. While he was saying this, a cloud formed and began to overshadow them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. Then a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent and reported to no one in these days any of the things which they had seen. So here we have one of those times when Jesus only takes Peter, James, and John with him. These are his three closest friends. And we learn from this that all of us, I think, have some friends that are closer to others, and that is okay. There are some people we click with a little bit better. We have to love all people. We might not like all people as much as we do others, if that makes sense. So Jesus has this inner circle, Peter, James, and John, that he often takes with him into certain situations where the others are not invited. And so he takes these three up onto a mountain to pray. Mark tells us that it is a high mountain. In verse 32, we find Peter, James, and John are sleeping for the first part of this, like they are in the Garden of Gethsemane later. But uh, as they are sleeping, Jesus is transfigured. Uh, in Matthew and Mark, his figure is changed, literally transfigured, and he starts shining. And his faith, face and his clothing become as white as the sun, uh, as white as life, uh, as light itself. I think one of the accounts says that his garments were whiter than any launderer on earth could whiten them. You know, so whiter than bleach can get your clothing kind of thing. It, he was glowing. We also find that Moses and Elijah show up. And unlike Matthew, Mark, uh, Matthew and Mark, Luke tells us what they are discussing. In verse 31, notice Moses and Elijah are speaking with Jesus about his coming departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. This obviously seems to be a reference to his death, his crucifixion. Moses and Elijah are maybe encouraging Jesus concerning what is about to happen. You know, come on, you can do this. We're, you know, behind you here. This is... It's been prophesied, you're the one, let's do it, kind of thing, perhaps. Uh, by the way, I always find it interesting that Peter and the others, once they wake up, they recognize Moses and Elijah as being Moses and Elijah. Uh, obviously, name tags of some kind were involved there, right? No, not, uh, you know, did, didn't say, hello, my name is Moses or Elijah, nothing like that, uh, Probably not anyway, but uh, but they can be recognized, and that's always fascinating to me. Somehow they knew who these men were, whether there was an introduction, whether they just knew. I don't know. Um, sometimes people ask whether we will recognize each other in heaven. You know, when we die, you know, in the next world, the life to come, will we know people on the other side? Will we know who we are? Will we recognize friends and family and so on? And this seems to help answer that. You know, somehow, some way, there is some kind of recognition that takes place here. Even though Peter, James, and John had never seen Moses and Elijah, somehow they knew who these two men were. Uh, Peter is in awe of what is happening, and he reacts by graciously, I'm sure in his opinion, offering to build three tabernacles or tents to like little shrines to honor the occasion, you know, and they're all three like on equal ground as I see it here. One for Jesus, one for Moses, one for Elijah. However, at that moment, they are surrounded by a cloud. And this voice from heaven interrupts and says, this is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And so whatever we get out of the transfiguration, this is what God wants us to get out of it. The main point of this paragraph is Listen to Jesus. Listen to my son, God is saying from heaven. And apparently Peter wasn't quite getting this out of this at the time. And so God has to intervene here. You know, he was looking at Moses, Elijah, and Jesus all on equal ground. And 
God steps in and says, no, listen to my son. Um, as I see it, Moses represents the law. Elijah represents the prophets. And the message here is, listen to Jesus. The law and the prophets have their place. They're important. They're inspired. But Jesus is the fulfillment of the prophets. Jesus is the one that Moses and Elijah were looking forward to. And all of a sudden, Jesus is left alone. The other two disappear. Uh, Matthew tells us that Jesus comes over to Peter, James, and John. He touches them and says, arise and do not be afraid. I'm sure this was traumatic for these men. According to Matthew and Mark, on the way back down the mountain, Jesus tells them to keep this quiet. You know, let's not tell anybody about what just happened up here, you know, until he has risen from the dead. At which point they immediately start wondering, what in the world is he talking about, risen from the dead? What does that mean? Uh, in Matthew and Mark, there's a bit of a discussion about the prophecy of Elijah coming. Jesus explains that John the Baptist was Elijah. And so now we pick up with something that happens the next day. So let's move on to Luke 9. 37 through 43, at least the first part of verse 43, you'll notice there's a paragraph division right in the middle of that verse. So Luke 9, 37 through 43. On the next day, when they came down from the mountain, a large crowd met him, and a man from the crowd shouted, saying, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only boy. And a spirit seizes him, and he suddenly screams, and it throws him into a convulsion with foaming at the mouth, and only with difficulty does it leave him, mauling him as it leaves. I begged your disciples to cast it out, and they could not. And Jesus answered and said, You unbelieving and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you and put up with you? Bring your son here. While he was still approaching, the demon slammed him to the ground and threw him into a convulsion. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the boy and gave him back to his father. And they were all amazed at the greatness of God. As I picture this, it's almost like Moses coming down from Mount Sinai after getting the Ten Commandments. You know, total chaos. They get away for a few minutes, they come down, and everything flies to pieces. In Moses' case, remember, he comes down to everybody worshiping the golden calf, this huge party atmosphere. But here, Jesus comes down, and there's a huge argument between his disciples and some scribes. It's almost like the teacher leaving the classroom for 30 seconds. And he or she comes back in, and, and everybody runs to get to the teacher to tell their side of the story first because something, you know, has just gone haywire. And here the issue is a man brought his demon-possessed son to be healed, but the disciples couldn't do it. And so there's this conflict, and everything is in just, just total chaos. And it's a serious situation. This evil spirit from childhood, we learn, uh, takes control of the boy, throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth. He grinds his teeth. He stiffens out. He screams. He convulses. It often throws him into the fire and into the water. That's combining, those are the symptoms from all three accounts. And we can hardly imagine that. You know, our kids are, you know, they get into enough trouble on their own, don't they? They get hurt enough without some evil spirit throwing them into the water and fire and, and all this. So these are the details from all the accounts. So Jesus then rebukes pretty much everybody for their lack of faith. Afterwards, according to Matthew and Mark, the disciples pull Jesus aside and they ask him, you know, what's up with that? Why couldn't we uh, cast out this demon like you did? And Jesus explains, this kind cannot come out by anything but prayer. And so perhaps they kind of overlooked the obvious, you know, that they needed God's approval and God's help doing this, we might say. And this is where Matthew includes the statement about having faith like a mustard seed, the kind of faith that can move mountains. That was said in this context. So let's do one more paragraph tonight. We pick up with the second half of verse number 43. So let's look at Luke 9, 43b uh, through 45. Luke 9, 43 through 45. But while everyone was marveling at all that he was doing, he said to his disciples, let these words sink into your ears, for the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. But they did not understand this statement. And it was concealed from them so that they would not perceive it. And they were afraid to ask him about this statement. Remember, Jesus had just said something very similar to this just a little bit earlier in this chapter, didn't he? But he repeats it here. It's almost like they're not getting it. And so he says it again. And once again, they don't understand. In fact, this truth seems to be almost miraculously hidden from them in some way. And so they're afraid to talk about it anymore. It's out there, but they don't discuss it. Uh, in terms of timing, the harmony has an interesting chart, almost at the very, very end. It's even after the scripture index. I mean, like the last three pages. And on page 348, you can look up the section that we're in right now. 
And all of these things seem to happen in the summer of AD 29. So as they, they add all this together, what we're talking about here is very roughly in the summer of 29. Jesus is crucified in the spring of AD 30. And so the crucifixion is less than a year away, maybe nine months away at this point. So we're getting very close to the crucifixion. So let's, next week, let's pick up with Luke 9.46, and we'll move forward from there. Thank you for being with us tonight, either online or on the phone. Uh, be sure to send me any prayer concerns so I can get those in the bulletin. Next week, come prepared by reading Luke 9.46 through chapter 10, verse 29 before class. You might even want to look into this in the Harmony of the Gospels. Again, if you don't have that book, let me know. I'll be glad to help you with that. But let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we praise you tonight as the one and only, all-powerful, awesome God with whom all things are possible. You are a God who heals. You are a God who can feed thousands with nothing but a small lunch shared by a little boy. You have the power to take the little that we have and to use it to do great and awesome things. As we interact with the world around us for the rest of this week, we pray that we might use our resources in a way that honors you and makes you happy. We pray that we might help others in meaningful ways and that we might be able to tell people what your son means to us, that he is indeed the Christ, the chosen one of God. We are thankful for the law and for the prophets, but more than anything, we are thankful tonight for Jesus, the fulfillment of all prophecy. We pray that we might listen to him above all others. Thank you for your word. Thank you for letting us study together. Please continue to bless those who work in health care. Bless our first responders, those who put themselves in danger for the purpose of helping others. We pray for patience. We pray that we might not only be patient ourselves this coming week, but we pray that we might be examples of patience and calm in a world that seems to be in almost constant conflict. Tonight, we also pray for justice, we pray for understanding, we pray for honest and open hearts, that we might accept your word for what it really is, the word of truth. We come to you tonight with these requests in the name of Jesus, your Son, our Lord and our Savior. Amen.